this event follows on a, a similarly titled event we held uh, in this room a year ago, uh, just a few weeks after uh, Senator DeLima uh, began her incarceration at uh, Cap Crane. Uh, the event featured a video from Vice President Roberto of the Philippines, which uh, quickly became controversial there. Uh, political figures in the Philippines, including the Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, misrepresented our event and the Vice President's video in order to create a, a political attack on the Vice President, uh, which was potent uh, but, uh, but temporary. Uh, however, it did succeed in their objective of distracting from the discussion that the Vice President was attempting to forward, uh, namely the abuses in President Duterte's uh, war on drugs. Uh, so we are still here, and the Philippines has, uh, has more champions, and uh, I'm proud that uh, we have them here with us uh, today. Um, uh, so uh, I think I'd like to uh, turn this over to my co-moderator, Marco Perduca, former senator of Italy, to introduce our uh, keynote speaker. Thank you, Jay. Uh, last year, one of the issues that was discussed is exactly what Senator De Lima <coughs> included in the final part of her statement, which is investigations or information to be shared with the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. As you may have read in the press, over the last 48 hours, the Philippines has decided to withdraw from the stat Rome Statute of the ICC. Uh, this is a complicated technical uh, procedure that after the announcement we'll have to have some institutional steps. Certainly the government will have to look into that. And I'm not sure how it, will, how it works in the Philippines, but Senator Trianis will tell us about it. Parliament would also have a say. But it's not automatic. It doesn't mean that the day in which the president said something, some, that something happens because international law, it's a little different than domestic legislation. So. For yet an, for another year at least, the Philippines will be <coughs> under the jurisdiction of the ICC. Now, if they co collaborate or not with what the, the Hague will ask them, it's a different matter. But we believe that if it weren't, also for the event we organized last year, and the work of civil society activists, human rights defenders in the Philippines and elsewhere in Europe, this would have never happened. And despite the fact that it's negative news, uh, hearing that uh, the Filipino Philippines may withdraw. In a way, I think we touched a nerve and something we still believe may come out of that. Uh, one of the organizations that was present last year that couldn't be here with us today is No Peace Without Justice, which has been championing the ICC for the last 25 years, and I've been working with them for at least 15 of my international experience uh, in, in New York, and they are still working <coughs> on a dossier that at some point will be Share if nothing is going to happen inside a court, uh, something a lot of things should happen outside the court. And certainly, events like this and the tour, the, raise, the awareness, the awareness raising uh, activities that other uh, friends uh, have been doing are part of this uh, effort. I met for the first time in my life in person Senator Trianes last year in November in Milan, where I used to be the Italian coordinator of the uh, uh, NGO called Parliamentarians for Global Action. He's a, a, a standing member, uh, where we were discussing the death penalty around the world. It was a panel that was not necessarily speaking on drug-related drug crimes, but certainly was using that as an example of how recent developments, so to speak, are taking us back to the late 80s, early 90s. And unfortunately, <laughs> where you don't have the death penalty used for uh, drug-related crimes like Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and Singapore, you have other kinds of policies that are taking place. But the extrajudicial killings and summary executions are certainly one of those, regardless of who uh, perpetrates them. The problem here is not only that we're going back 20 years, but perhaps we're going back 65 years. Why the war on Iraq was launched? All the people in the room, so perhaps the majority of the people in the room, believe that it wasn't to target drugs. It was to target big chunks of society. And we believe, and I think this is what uh, Senator Trianis will tell us about, is what exactly is happening today in the Philippines. So we welcome you with uh, bad news, which is also a badge of honor, at least for some politicians. Uh, Senator Trianis has been indicted last night uh, in the Philippines for sedition 
or something has said while in office in a, a, a place which is where you actually can speak out your mind and also say things <coughs> that may not be liked by the people that are involved, but certainly are part of the political discussion. And using criminal law against the freedom of speech and certain political actions that doesn't belong to a democratic society and a democratic world we want to live in. So you have the floor, and thank you very much for accepting the invitation and be with us today. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Senator Marco uh, David, for uh, inviting me uh, into this forum. Uh, to everyone, good morning. On uh, September 30, 2016, Pre Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte proudly said this on national TV. Hitler massacred 3 million Jews. Now, there is 3 million, there is a 3 million drug there are. And we have to slaughter now. At least, if Germany had Hitler, the Philippines would have, but, you know, my victims, I would like to be all criminals to finish the problem of my country and save the next generation from the peace. Okay. Uh, let me repeat what he said. Hitler massacred 3 million Jews. Now, there are 3 million drug addicts. I'd be happy to slaughter them. Also, on 05 August 2016, he said this I don't give a shit to Anonymous Corilla. This campaign against this, this war against the drug. <coughs> Again, just to be clear, Duterte said that's why my order really is shoot to kill. I don't care about human rights. Believe me, I don't give a shit to what. They want to say to this war against drugs. End of quote. Finally, on 10 February 2017, Duterte said this. Very young fentanyl. Uh, <coughs> the doctor stopped it because he got mad. I'm supposed to cut it into four pieces, the one piece that you get from the package. And there was a time na yung buong nilagay ko because more than just the disappearance of me, you feel that you are in cloud nine. But about everything is okay with the world, nothing to worry about. Okay. As he admitted against the, doc against the advice of his doctor, Duterte placed the whole fentanyl patch instead of cutting it into four pieces. Because, and I quote, more than just the disappearance of pain, you feel that you are on cloud nine. Yeah. <laughs> it is like uh, everything is okay with the world. Nothing to worry about. End of quote. Fentanyl, as, you may, as most of you may know, is now labeled as the most dangerous drug in North America. It is highly addictive and even more potent than heroin. These statements from Duterte basically define the messed up state the Philippines is in. We have a war on drugs policy that's run by a leader who is a self-confessed fentanyl addict with a murder streak. This same leader, as the father of the nation, is mandated by the Philippine Constitution to uphold the human rights of his own people. True enough, since the first day in office, Duterte embarked on a killing spree using agents of the state that left thousands of our countrymen dead. How many exactly? The government spokesmen say 4,000. But human rights groups say at least 13,000. Well, today we would finally settle this matter. Let me direct you to an undisputed reference. The Duterte administration's year-end report, 2017 accomplishments. This was released by the Office of the President to the media officially on 26 December 2017. <coughs> on page 22 of this document, under the accomplishments of the Department of Labor and Interior Local Government, 
Department of Interior and Local Government, <coughs> or DILG. This is the department that supervises the Philippine National Police. Specifically, under the section of fighting illegal drugs, the DILG listed 3,967 drug personalities who died in anti-drug operations from July 1, 2016 to November 27, 2017. These are the cases of those who allegedly resisted arrest. But curiously, the DILG also listed 16,335 homicide cases under investigation from July 1, 2016 to September 30, 2017. Since it was listed under the section of fighting illegal drugs, therefore, all of these deaths are drug-related and not for other causes. The report cited the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, Philippine National Police, National Bureau of Investigation, and Bureau of Customs as sources of this data. Those killed by unknown assailants then dumped on sidewalks or vacant lots with bodies or faces wrapped in packing tape would fall in this category. Most of them have this ubiquitous cardboards on top of the dead bodies saying, I am a drug pusher, don't be like me. Now, before I get accused of peddling fake news, this accomplishment report was reported in the media, in various media outfits like uh, GMA News Online. These are the major news outfits in Manila. If you can see here, they cited the same numbers, 3,867 and 16,335. Also in the ABS-CBN uh, News, also, 3,967 and 16,355. Then, at the inquirers, same data, 3,967 and 16,355. And was even posted in the official Facebook page of the Philippine National Police. So, these are the same numbers. Now, going back to the official government figures, if we add the deaths resulting from police operations and the death uh, or the drug-related homicides under investigation, we get 20,322 total number of deaths slash EJKs <coughs> under Duterte's war on drugs as of December 2017. Now, the biggest breakthrough in this document is in their hubris in reporting the deaths of thousands of Filipinos as an accomplishment, they basically admitted that there are no so-called vigilante killings and that these deaths are in fact state-sponsored executions. <coughs> Why else would you take credit for the work of unknown assailants or vigilantes and include it in Duterte's year-end report as an accomplishment? I believe the International Criminal Court would be very interested in this piece of information. As it is, such a, a number is quite shocking by any standard. But can you imagine a president of any country who would actually cite the deaths of his own people from summary executions as an accomplishment? Remember, these deaths include those merely suspected of being drug pushers who were not given a day in court to prove their innocence or even if guilty were no longer arrested as our laws dictate and those suspected of being drug addicts were not even given a chance to be drug tested or even if they are real addicts 
were no longer given a chance to be rehabilitated and reformed. What's really unfortunate is ma majority of uh, Duterte <coughs> apologists and supporters are willing to turn a blind eye towards these deaths in their belief that this strategy of killing addicts and pushers could help eradicate crime and illegal drugs in our country. But how about the hundreds or maybe thousands of totally innocent people who were neither pushers nor users, but were killed just the same, either because of mistaken identity or simply because they were at the wrong place at the wrong time? Like Kia De Los Santos, the 17-year-old boy who was, who was just walking casually in their neighborhood when he was suddenly apprehended, dragged, then fatally shot by police officers while he was pleading for his life. This incident was uh, caught on tape, by the way. And the more than 30 children who were killed in this so-called war on drugs. Like uh, Saninio Butukan, a seven-year-old boy. Saninio died when he was hit by a stray bullet while the police were conducting an anti-drug operation in Consolacion Cebu last December. 3-2016. Danica <coughs> is the granddaughter of a drug surrenderer. Three days after her grandfather surrendered to the police, an unknown man repeatedly shot him in their house in the Gupan. Danica died due to a shot in the head last August 2016. Altea died with her father when they were repeatedly shot by policemen in Gihudmuhan, <coughs> Negros Oriental. Her father allegedly fired a gun to the policeman and was suspected to be a drug dealer. Francisco, a five-year-old five boy, died when their house was repeatedly shot by unknown suspects in Pasay City last December 11, 2016. His father was suspected to be a drug dealer also died. Now, aside from those uh, directly killed, there are now orphans uh, because of those uh, victims who were killed. According to the Assistant Secretary of uh, the Department of Social Welfare and Development, an estimated number of, or an estimate of 18,000 children have lost their parents because of their, the war on drugs. This one, the case of uh, Joaquin Garbo. He has... Uh, he had 10 children before he was killed. Hours after he was arrested from their house and was brought to the Special Anti-Illegal Drugs Unit in the Botas, Joaquin Garbo was found dead. His wife and 10 children were orphaned. This had a bad effect on his son, John Ryan, who keeps on saying, I will take revenge for Papa. They took and killed him. He was just sleeping. Sometimes he was seen by his aunt playing with a toy gun. According to John Ryan, this is just a toy, it's not mine. This is just plastic, not like the one they used to kill Papa. What is uh, perplexing about this uh, drug war is how ruthless and unforgiving it is to the ordinary Filipino, yet quite lenient on big-time drug offenders. <coughs> the uh, Department of Justice cleared everyone implicated in the importation of the 6.4 billion peso shabu shipment. Next. And here's the thing. Duterte promoted the DOJ prosecutor who exonerated those implicated in this uh, <coughs> Shabu smuggling case. Next. Just last Monday, the DOJ cleared suspected drug lords from uh, their cases at the department. One, this one in the picture, is a, a friend or a compadre, as we call, of uh, Duterte himself. Peter Lim was uh, named by the Philippine National Police, the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency, and Duterte himself as the biggest drug lord in the Philippines. Yet, he cleared 
uh, he was clear to fall. <coughs> Next. Worse, Duterte promoted the DOJ prosecutor who cleared uh, Peter Lim and the other drug lords from their illegal drug cases. So, it is clear now, this is not a real war against illegal drugs as claimed by Duterte. Now, the question is, what is it for? Well, based on our analysis and the uh, inside information, the nationwide EJ case are but part of Duterte's diabolical plan to control every segment of society, much like what he did as mayor of Davao City. It is meant to strike fear in the hearts of the people so he could control and manipulate them. Expanding further, Duterte in just 20 months has weakened practically all democratic institutions in the Philippines and now has almost total control of every sector of Philippine society. He has been uh, persecuting the political opposition, like uh, Senator uh, Dilima, and uh, as mentioned by uh, Senator Marco, <coughs> just this morning, the Department of Justice has filed a case uh, against me for uh, inciting to sedition. Inciting what? I really don't know. But uh, that's how the Philippine courts are now working. He has been harassing mainstream media, undermining the church, attacking the ombudsman. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court right now is facing uh, an impeachment complaint uh, herself. And most of all, he has corrupted the police. Moreover, there is now a perpetual martial law in Mindanao. A few months ago, Duterte even floated the idea of declaring a revolutionary government. And now he is attempting to amend the 1987 constitution to ensure his hold on power beyond his term. Truly, all these tactics are straight out of a dictator's handbook. Even the ICC, before uh, Duterte withdrew, uh, from the ICC was not spared from the harassment. Truly, there is a creeping dictatorship in the Philippines and the Filipinos are helpless witnesses to it. So the question is, how do we get out of this mess? Well, the international community, to include the foreign media, has been very helpful in calling out and putting pressure on the Philippine government to stop the extrajudicial killings. Because of this, the government has been forced to step back and is now trying to repackage the image of this drug campaign. For this, we are very grateful. But the killings continue. Thus, we appeal for your continued monitoring of the Philippine situation and that, you're, and that you continue to urge the Duterte government to respect <coughs> the rights and the rule of law. On our end, as the political opposition, to make Duterte accountable for his actions, we filed a communication at the International Criminal Court on crimes against humanity committed by Duterte. Recently, the ICC has announced that they will conduct a preliminary examination on this, and we are earnestly hoping that this would lead to a formal investigation and the eventual arrest of Duterte. Incidentally, just yesterday, Duterte officially withdrew from uh, the ICC, as mentioned earlier, Fortunately for us, based on the Rome Statute, a withdrawal will only take effect a year after the official notification. So bad news for Mr. Duterte, the ICC cases will continue. Finally, while Duterte remains relatively popular in the Philippines, his numbers have declined significantly <coughs> compared to when he first assumed office and are expected to decline further Filipinos may be timid and patient, but we certainly know right from wrong. And we do have a tipping point. Ultimately, as it should be in any functioning democracy, the fate of our country is in our hands. Still, we expect this to be a very difficult battle. But we certainly believe that Duterte is one evil man. And being so, he's on the wrong side of history. Since all evil tyrants who lived in this world before him have been struck down from their thrones eventually and suffered <coughs> ignominious ends. Thank you.
think it's a testimony to that. Uh, incidentally, two heads of states over the last two weeks have one declared that the death penalty should be applied to drug dealers, and another one has changed the constitution to stay in power forever. They are the biggest allies of the Philippines. It's true that it will take a year to, um, to really leave the ICC, but it's also true, unfortunately, and you have demonstrated what has already been going on, that withdrawing from the International Criminal Court is withdrawing from the concept of impunity and so, or introducing impunity <coughs> to political measures. Uh, I would like also to introduce uh, briefly Hassan Basti from Forum Droge, who's one of the organizations that in Italy has been working on this. They also have, and uh, Leonardo Fiorentini is here broadcasting live on Facebook, a column in, uh, in a newspaper every week. And we have tried to keep the attention of the Italian media on this. I don't know how much that has helped, but I, I'm glad to hear that international press has been uh, uh, helpful for you. So because of time constraint, uh, Hassan will not speak. So back to you, Dave, uh, for the rest of the panel. Okay, uh, just a few quick notes before I introduce our, uh, our next speaker. Uh, one, uh, we've ordered light refreshments, which I didn't check on, but should be down the hallway in the corner near the coffee area. Uh, people are welcome to uh, join us there to talk uh, for longer. Uh, secondly, um, one of our co-sponsoring groups uh, inadvertently uh, left off of the list of the promotions, uh, Surawat in, in Nepal. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our uh, co-sponsors over time constraints. I, I won't um, read them. Lastly, uh, some small pieces of paper, uh, if you're willing to give us your name and contact information, uh, are, uh, are circulating. Uh, so, um, uh, Elisa Carlos is a spokesperson for the uh, I Defend Human Rights Coalition in the Philippines in defense of uh, Freedom of Dignity Movement, that's and Dignity Movement, Rights and Dignity Movement. He's a highly sought after speaker. This is his second trip to Vienna this week. And, um, and, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. David Borden. I'd uh, like to take this opportunity to thank uh, StopTheDrugWar.org, crucial ally at this point in terms of asserting and defending human rights in the Philippines and, of course, Senator Marco. Um, and the warm greetings of human rights solidarity to all. Um, and, yeah, just to introduce IDEFEND. IDEFEND was established um, last August or August 2016 precisely uh, to respond to these mass killings and, of course, um, uh, to, uh, to uh, provide refuge also for the many families or victims of extrajudicial killings. We are now engaged in our second international solidarity and information tour precisely um, uh, to uh, shed uh, information, um, uh, dispel the myths that, this, uh, that Duterte has been sowing through his um, uh, propaganda machinery and um, uh, really uh, contribute to, uh, to Filipinos breaking the silence uh, uh, this violent president is really dependent on um, a mass base outside the Philippines, our huge overseas Filipino work uh, force. No? Um, so uh, all of us are aware of this uh, drug war operating outside the rule of law, which has made human life very cheap uh, in the Philippines. And uh, it's the worst human rights crisis since the Marcos dictatorship, one that is dehumanizing all Filipinos. Um, it's clear that uh, President Duterte established a permission structure for mass murder. Uh, it's clear that he uh, redefined the rules of impunity and institutionalized it. Um, he popularized the idea that the crisis in our country can be solved by exterminating addicts, drug dependents, and criminals. Uh, he conditioned the Philippine National Police to be quick on the trigger and have a general contempt for the rule of law, um, promising the protection from litigation, uh, putting up a reward system, and forced quotas, firing uh, or transferring police officers if they do not meet the required um, uh, results. No? Peter Style, he effectively dehumanized and defined drug dependence as the inconvenient sector, no? Hitler style. Uh, through sustained incitement, hate, and violence, this kill society's undesired or de facto social cleansing policy has led to the deaths of 
conservatively 12,000, uh, but our qualitative data actually reveals uh, a, a definite pattern of uh, what human rights experts refer to as um, police vigilantism, whereby um, uh, the president and high officials of the land can dissociate themselves legally from the killings, uh, but nonetheless claim them as accomplishments of the state. So this has led to the deaths of the most neglected, beaten down, impoverished individuals, you know, um, including uh, children. Uh, we have offered uh, solutions, you know, compassionate, evidence-based, um, sustainable, uh, health and human rights-centered approaches which have been effective elsewhere in the world. This violent approach has never worked elsewhere. Um, also, radical reforms in an, the, our inoperable and anti poor criminal justice system. And most importantly, an investment in a life of dignity. There is a huge market of beaten down, impoverished uh, Filipinos in the Philippines predisposed to becoming exploited into a life of crime and drugs. So it's clear to Duterte that there is a direct relationship between the decrease of crime and the, the rise of a standard of living. But this government, this president does not have a social agenda that will uplift the lives of the poor. We have been monitoring his social agenda. Um, it's the same economic policies that will uh, deepen uh, inequality. So instead of consulting and listening to us, he demonized uh, human rights defenders. He demonized us. He actually so sold misperceptions about human rights ideals, values, and principles, and defined us as the enemy. Um, and presented human rights groups as cuddlers of criminals and obstructionists of justice and development and promoted the narrative the world will never be safe for as long as these human rights groups are here. This has eroded public belief in human rights and secured some level of public acceptance should the killings spill over to our sector. Um, yes, ordered the police several times. Uh, order the police to shoot if we obstruct justice, and even uh, publicly said that he will harvest us together with <coughs> addicts, you know, using the word harvest. Uh, this situation has drastically constricted space for human rights discourse and defense. Uh, what is the impact of uh, this drug war? This endangers everyone in Philippine society. This, uh, um, yeah, anyone can now be accused of, uh, of being a drug dependent and not have uh, the opportunity to defend themselves in court. Um, contempt of the rule of law by law enforcers leads to the breakdown of our democratic institutions. We threaten to transfigure the mindsets of our entire policing establishment, transforming even the most law-abiding police officers into butchers. Uh, we threaten to throw away all human rights education work that we have invested in for the past 32 years. Um, human rights groups and the Commission on Human Rights. The normalization of the killings is worsening the collective sociopathy or damage to civic behavior. Now Duterte has extended the drug war um, up to 2022. Uh, the problem is now that the dormant, dormant death squad network has been unleashed into a, an entire epidemic. It's important to, to actually expose his true intentions as Senator uh, Trillianes has mentioned, this drug war is just part of an, a, a whole scenario. It is a tool to actually advance his authoritarian agenda um, as a populist tool to establish a culture of fear and silence. Um, and uh, for us, it's about the falling apart of democracy and the retrogression into dictatorship and the disintegration of Philippine society. The situation today is the closest we have been to an authoritarian government in 30 years, with him rolling back the gains in human rights and democracy. Uh, his his uh, two political projects now, charter change and federalism, are nothing more than the realignment of the elite with uh, the Visayan and, and, uh, and, and Mindanao um, elite actually wanting a bigger share of the pie. And it's, uh, it um, risks uh, dissolving nationalist, economic, and human rights provisions doing away with safeguards and checks and balances on term extension, judicial and congressional review of a martial law declaration, 
and abolish constitutional commissions such as the Commission on Human Rights. They also have a well-oiled propaganda machinery which has been put in place um, when he, he uh, entered office. No, um, It's um, efficient in terms of sowing um, misperceptions, half-truths and lies, and of course his anti-human rights and kill rhetoric and shaping public opinion. Um, he also has made full use of bureaucratic and political apparatuses to carry out political persecution of those who represent our checks and balances. And of course, his uh, uh, political critics, no, that includes uh, even misogynistic uh, public comments. Our Vice President, Senator De Lima, our Supreme Court Chief, and our Ombudsperson's Chief. He's been whitewashing the Marcos years, no, um, paving the way for the rehabilitation of the Marcos name, um, um, as well as a, pol a political uh, situation of, of the Marcoses, of the comeback. Um, yes, institutionalized vigilantism, pseudo mass movements, as Hitler style, setting up actually um, uh, extremist nationalist groups that. Uh, and, and they're organizing rallies uh, that is uh, publicly or government funded, um, which is constricting space for genuine public actions. What are the challenges for us human rights defenders in the Philippines? It's enormous and unprecedented. While being targeted as, uh, threatened as the next targets, we must persevere to fight apathy and help Philippine society establish respect for life and our, reclaiming our collective humanity. Um, the difference between then, Marcos dictatorship and now, there is a huge section of Philippine society actually misled and uh, dis detesting us. No? And of course, this death squad epidemic can be used against us anytime. Uh, while government are now upgrading its surveillance capacity and infrastructure. Uh, a lot of us are in the persons uh, of interest list as well. And our task now is to expose the duplicity of Duterte who claims to be anti-poor but really has no social agenda. Um, and how to make sure that our fellow Filipinos will not behave like the good Germans of the Nazi era. Also documenting cases and providing sanctuaries to families of uh, victims of extrajudicial killings. It's important to hold this president accountable. And um, yeah, Duterte has shown that he can kill Thousands, the rest, curtailing civil liberties, declaring one man rule, will be a mopping up operation. So, our calls now we have been campaigning for the Philippines to be suspended from the Human Rights Council. It does not deserve to be there. And of course, an international independent investigation um, yeah, into, into these uh, into the, uh, the killings. No? So, essentially, yeah, we strongly condemn the increasing attacks against human rights defenders and political activists. Including, including the placing of the UN Special Rapporteur on Indigenous Peoples' Rights and other defenders on a terrorist list. Um, the killings of political and social activists uh, have already begun. No? So uh, if he can declare martial law, justify martial law declaration in Mindanao, he's just waiting for the right pretext to declare it nationwide with the total breakdown of the peace talks with the CPP and the FNP. So thank you.